What is um, the stop suffering school all about? How do we stop suffering? If somebody were to approach you like a layman, they're like, hey, man, like, I, you know, I'm suffering. How do I get out of it? How would you explain that? Um, I point out to them that uh, there's only one cause of all of their suffering. Um, it might appear that their suffering is caused by other people, life, health, circumstances, events, but actually that all of their suffering is caused by their reaction to those events, namely and specifically the stories you tell yourself in your head, mm -hmm. your interpretations, the voice, in, I call it the voice in the head that never shuts up that you think is you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would point to the fact that they can tell for themselves is that the, the same thing can happen to two people. One person interprets it one way, tells themselves one story about it the other person tells themselves another story about it and they have two, two completely different experiences i'm going to talk about it later but i lost a leg in in 2008 oh. and i lost an eye a couple of years ago i've had a lot of tragedy in my life but because of the way i framed it you know reframing because of the way i looked at it chose to look at it i told myself a story that made the tragedy mm. a gift wow you know, lemons from lemonade, that, that, that's the power of the human spirit. Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, one of my favorite books. People in a concentration camp have shown this. Many Christian mystics and martyrs have shown this. Many people have shown that something that would break most people or some tragedy or terrible thing can happen to certain people and they can turn it around and make it the best thing that ever happened to them. Yeah. That's my story, basically. I've done that a number of times. And everyone can do it once they get a hold of the voice in the head that never shuts up that you think is you. My whole system, my whole teaching is based around uh, what I feel because I've never heard. Well, I got it from Michael A. Singer, uh, the untethered soul, beautiful teacher. Uh, he called it the voice in the head. And I added the that never shuts up that you think is you. Mm -hmm. And I use it with my students and I found it to be way more effective than self-inquiry because you can self-inquire all you like and get to, oh yeah, there's no one there. Hmm. And then, then the voice in the head starts talking again and you start listening to it. Yeah. So to me, the focus is on notice the stories you're telling yourself. Notice. And if you, once you start to notice the voice in your head, you'll notice it's, it's all bullshit. Yeah. It's all bullshit. The monkey mind is 100% pure bullshit. It doesn't know anything. It yeah. doesn't know anything but its own thoughts. It doesn't know anything about reality. It just knows its judgments, opinions, interpretations, stories, which is basically another word for bullshit. <laughs> so I train people not to believe yourself. That's why I say, I say, don't believe yourself. Whatever your mind is telling you, ignore it. <sighs> Come into the moment, become present. I teach people how to witness and I teach people embodied presence and once you can become fully present in your body such that you feel tingling aliveness all through your body and once you can witness your rising emotions and rising thoughts without identifying with them you're free mm. you don't need obviously you know there's levels of mastery and the great masters have reached a, a place where their mind is just totally silent but you can be free or awake or enlightened even when your mind's going if you're not identified with it, if yeah. you just allow it to do its thing. And that is a, an enlightenment that way more people can get to. So I focus on that level of enlightenment. I leave the other stuff, you know, for the person themselves. But I can help you get to a place where even though your monkey mind's going crazy and your emotions are going crazy, it's not bothering you mm -hmm. because you're identified with awareness, not, not objects of awareness. So that's what I'd say to someone. That's how to stop suffering. It's simple. It's a formula. Anyone can do it. You just have to recognize the truth. Your suffering is not caused by the world. Mm. It's caused by your thoughts. Yeah. And all of our thoughts are just temporary phenomena, right? Yeah. So that's why if we can get to the point of observation, we could see all of it come and go. All of our ups and downs, all of the woes the pains of the body all of it's going to come and go i think that's the most important thing that one can come to from a vantage point of, of observation of one's thoughts and sensations of the body is that it's all temporary man all of it's going to come and go and when we think that it's permanent when we think that whatever 
malady or condition or story or narrative that we put onto whatever's happening in our life, whatever circumstances arise. We think that like, oh, this is it. This sucks. I'm in this pit of darkness. The, the thoughts, the monkey mind, it attaches some kind of permanence in that story, like some kind of like end point, it seems. And that causes suffering. Essentially, that's suffering. I think um, a distinction that you made that's important is the difference between pain and suffering. That's huge. Because, you know, you've said you've experienced a lot of pain in your life, but you were able to almost detach yourself and just observe, just simply witness that for what it was, what it is, and see that it is just a, a, a story that you're told or the monkey mind is told, this unconscious part of your mind is told. And to have a different vantage point of the suffering, which then leads to no suffering. I see, from what I understand, I almost see the path of negating suffering in the human condition as just being able to like have a bird's eye view to use a metaphor, like just like taking a step back from it and having this other, other mind in a way, maybe some will say like the booty mind and just to, to see it all just uh, almost like a movie. It's like, a, yeah. just go by like a movie of life. I see that as a way to yeah. um, stop suffering. Would you say that's an apt description? Absolutely. That's what we call the witness. Mm -hmm. uh, the witness or um, unconditioned, yeah. unconditional, non-judgmental awareness. Yeah. That mm -hmm. is the key to every spiritual path knows this. And mm -hmm. it, and what I described it as, it's, it's actually technically, it's just consciousness that is not identified with the objects of consciousness or yeah. awareness that's not identified with you. So objects are forms, things that can be perceived and known. That includes thoughts, emotions, memories, sensations, images, and physical objects. They're all things that are known by awareness. I mean, I know that I'm talking to you because of this object, my laptop, and seeing, you know, that you're, you're all, everything that you're seeing and I'm seeing and the, the, the viewers are seeing is in your awareness, right? And they're all objects that can be known by awareness. Otherwise, you wouldn't know them. Mm. That is object consciousness. That is normal human consciousness is object consciousness. We are fixated and basically addicted <laughs> to the objects that arise in our awareness. Yeah. Spiritual or awakened or non-dual is to be fixated and addicted to the awareness itself, the witness, yeah. the bird's eye view. That's all it is. It's just... And, and this is why that paradox comes in, because there's nothing wrong with object consciousness. It's where all, all of the fun of life comes from. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you don't realize that you are the larger self, the witness, the unconditioned one, if you think you are the, the one that's identified with objects, the ego, if you think you are the ego or the body mind, you will suffer. Mm -hmm. There's no way around it because it, all things are temporary. As you said, this too shall pass. Everything's arising and passing away. There's no permanence in this world. And so you're happy, if your happiness depends on something outside of yourself or an experience, you can't be happy because it's always going to change. So basically, as the Buddha said, <laughs> life is suffering, craving and aversion. If your object identified, you will, you will crave and you will fear. You will, you will want, need to avoid certain things that are painful, and you will need to, you know, grasp and cling to things that are pleasurable. That's human life. That's normal human life. Nothing wrong with it. But if you don't want to suffer anymore, that's when spirituality comes in. Mm -hmm. That's the only point of spirituality. Live your human life. Do you've done it a thousand, probably a million times before. We're all we all live millions of life because it's God living all of them anyway. Um, so it's like, yeah, you're here to enjoy human life. Absolutely. It's only when you decide as a soul, okay, I've had enough of this game. I want to move on to another one. Let me wake up to who I really am. Let me remember that I'm God. Yeah. That's what spirituality is. And, and God is the, the bird's eye view that you talked about, the witness, the one who is unaffected by the dream. Mm. It's the lucid dreamer that sees the dream, can enjoy the dream, but it's not frightened by the dream yeah. and it's not hurt by the dream. Now, mm -hmm. That's what spirituality is. Yeah. Ooh, that was a really good explanation. It actually seems Thanks, simple bro. in that way, right? Yeah. 
Mm. But it's like, it's like getting that glimpse. I feel as though is the tough part per se. If there is a difficult part, it's like being able to see that one is not the object. One is the subject. That's the tough part, man. I don't know. Like that's the glimpse, the awakening that one could say. That's the big difference in one's life. When one realizes that we're not the thoughts, the body, and all the phenomena associated with it. We're this witness consciousness, like you said. We are God and drag. Um, <laughs> that, to me, is the switch. Like That's the big light bulb moment in somebody's life. It's when they realize that there's way more going on than just the ups and downs of the body. That's yeah. huge. How yeah. do you think we get on that wavelength? Do you think it's like divine grace some people say there's nothing you can do is this you know you just just let it be man be in the moment then there's other people that will suggest modalities and practices and then other people will say take five grams of mushrooms in darkness uh i'm up in the air (laughs) man i have no idea Uh, every person i speak to really honestly every person i speak to gives me a different um prescription on how to do this some no prescription so what do you say um i say that it's a paradox. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true that there's nothing you can do because you don't exist. There's mm-hmm. nothing you as a separate being can do to wake up to the fact you're not a separate being. Just think, you know, just say it as simply as that. The, the separate being is an illusion, you know, a, a necessary and very useful, wonderful illusion. Uh, the best analogy is the dream analogy. So Rupert Spirit uses this, and I think it's the best. So when you have a dream, in order to, ex- let's say, for instance, you dream of being in Paris, in order to experience Paris, basically, you have to create a little a mini version of yourself, like, you know, uh, dream, let's call him Dream Gary, mm-hmm. uh, who can walk around in Paris, yeah? And he can have all sorts of experiences. He can be cha- chased by secret agents. He can meet a beautiful woman and it could be a wet dream or he can have monsters. You know, he can have all these experiences. Um, but while all of that's happening, real Gary is fast asleep and perfectly safe. And yeah. everything that's happening to little Gary is actually happening in, within real Gary's awareness, real Gary's mind, as it were, yeah? And so there's nothing that little Gary can do to wake up because he's not the one in control he's 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 been made he's a made up creation of big gary yeah. only big gary can do anything about the dream if big gary wakes up in the dream then then little gary can have a lucid dream and that's what enlightenment is it's just a lucid dream yeah. when you're still here in a body but you know you come from reality you come from non-duality so you're in duality but you know in this world, but not of it, my master says. You know you're from the non-dual world. And so a lucid dream is what enlightenment is. But the the, the dream character is not the one that wakes up because the dream character doesn't exist. It's only the dreamer that can wake up. So the people who say there's nothing you can do are right. However, and this is why it's a paradox, there's nothing you can do, but there's things you can stop doing. Uh And this is how I teach. I see. Stop believing in illusion recognize the dream that's what we can do and you said the hardest thing is to separate ourselves out from the object and 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 see that we're not our thoughts that's the hardest one for everybody yeah. is to i always say no teacher can get in between somebody and the voice in their head that never shuts up mm-hmm. i can't i've taught lots of people and i know that i can only help somebody that makes the effort to witness their mind, really witness it. No no spirituality, no awakening, nothing's going to happen until you realize, oh, it's just thoughts. That's not who I am. I'm not those, that's not my identity. It's thoughts arising and happening. And until somebody does, and there are practices for that. So that's the answer to your question. You can can practice not believing the dream. You can practice that's how you wake up. You stop believing in the, that the dream is real. And in, and, and that's how big, big Gary. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the way I look at it. It is grace. It is grace. That it is really is grace. And uh, so even when somebody's practicing these things, it 
it's a combination, like we were saying before. It's both. You know, God is reaching down with grace and you are reaching up simply through your willingness to allow for the fact that your reality is not real, to allow for the fact that this is an illusion, to allow for the fact that you're not your thoughts. If you have the will, that's what we call it, the little willingness. It's just the willingness to be wrong, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone thinks they're right about their perceptions. And it's just the willingness to be wrong about your own perceptions. Maybe I don't see the whole picture. Maybe I only see the tiny bit of visible light. Mm. Maybe I'm not right all the time. <laughs> and, and that's all God asks. Just uh, be, be willing to be humble and be wrong. And then grace comes. That's when you have, you know, without mushrooms, <laughs> that's when you have peak experiences. Mm. But you might be in nature. And nature tends to, you know, beautiful mountains. Nature humbles us. We realize the grandeur of nature. And in that humility, it's the same willingness. Okay, I don't actually know anything. I don't know who I am. I don't know what the world is. I don't know what reality is. I only know my own thoughts. And yet you have a mo an honest moment where you're humble. That's when grace happens. So I, I encourage people to obviously practice witnessing, practice watching your thoughts, watching your emotions. That is the, the technical skill of awakening. But more than that, practice humility. Mm. Practice recognizing that you don't know anything. You only know your own mind, your own thoughts, your own interpretations. You, you, you can't say that. You don't know the noumena. You only know the phenomena. Mm. Nobody knows reality, and we all act like we do. We think we're right about everything. <laughs> Yeah. That's the biggest barrier to aw awakening, spiritual arrogance or just arrogance in general. Yeah. Yep. So it's a willingness to surrender to the greater forces that one is involved in. Totally. Would you say our suffering is the catalyst to that? Sort of it can be. That? It yeah. can be. It's called the way of the Christ. That's that's the way that I've experienced it through suffering, and a lot of people have. It doesn't have to be there. Again, you know, there are as many paths as there are people. Mm. Um, you know, each individual soul has its own path, and uh, it's it's between you. <laughs> I call it. It's between God and God self. <laughs> you and me, we're God self, and then there's the one God, and God self. God has. A trillion, 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 trillion relationships with all its different God selves. Just like the sun has a trillion, trillion, trillion different relationships with every ray of light that beams out from it. Yeah. Just as the ocean has a trillion relationships with every wave on the ocean. God self is the ray and the wave. God is the sun and the ocean. And so, yeah. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> the suffering is. The oh, yeah. It's suffering catalyst. the catalyst. Yeah. Very often it is, for, I would say, probably the majority, simply because we need to be humbled because we're stuck in this belief that our yeah. thoughts are real and, and that we're right about everything. We, we believe our perceptions and our interpretations are real. So life needs to humble us. Yeah. If we were humble already, like uh, maybe an indigenous, indigenous people are way more humble than, you know, <laughs> us modern people, mm -hmm. they understand that nature, their relationship with nature is such that they couldn't survive without nature. They have to be humble before nature. Yeah. So that they probably don't need to go through suffering. We Western modern people are so <laughs> arrogant. We need to be slapped down. And, and that's why I think suffering is the path for most people. I think so too. Because if it is, if the path is like saying, there's got to be another way that has to be sparked by, us um being caught in some way that isn't the way does that make sense <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it has to yeah there has to be and that's humbling there's it's in our it's in our perceived suffering that leads us to out of the suffering i mean this is literally there was a conversation i think i said this in a previous pod between <clears throat> yogananda and ramana maharshi and yogananda literally asked him that he asked ramana um what is the direct way to God? And Ramana said, suffering. <laughs> he said, can it be any other way? Can, is there any other way to it? And Ramana was like, not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> he said, this is the way. And, he, and then Yogananda, Yogananda said, well, why? And he just said, that's just how it is. <laughs> he didn't explain. He was just, just, for some reason, that's just how it is. But I think it's, it's because of what you just said. It's uh, We need to be humbled. We think we're the yeah. center of the universe. We think... Yeah being a human being in the 21st century in the Western world, like 
we're in control 100% of our life and there's no greater forces. And yeah, it's just a really egocentric way of living. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. I would say even more than that. I, I mean, I'm not going to argue with the big man. I'm not going to argue with Romana. You know, <laughs> like, you know, I, his answer when somebody said to him, you know, how do I how do I learn to love other other people? And he goes, there are no others. It's my best art, spiritual mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I do think that in the context of modern Western people, he's right. But I genuinely feel that indigenous peoples for, for hundreds of thousands of years have, have also have a direct path, which is pre being present in the moment in your daily life. That, that's, that's, our, that's the way of mastery. You know, we were talking about my pathway. And it's making your life a living prayer or a living meditation mm. so that you are present and witnessing all the time. And, and, and to me, that is, that's the direct path. And I've gone through the suffering path, believe me, and we can get into that if you like. I really have. And although it brought me to a series of awakenings, none of them were permanent. However, when I started practicing making my life a living meditation, now I have ongoing freedom from suffering, not peaks and troughs, peak experience, awake for seven months and then crash or awake for three weeks and then crash, which is my past experience. Now I'm just on a nice little wavy thing of just awake enough. <laughs> I call it I'm awake enough for me. Like I don't suffer. I might not be Ramana Maharshi. I might not have a completely silent mind, but my mind does not disturb me. Yeah. I don't have fearful thoughts. I don't worry. I'm not neurotic. I don't regret the past. I don't care what people think about me. I just don't have any of that. And that is awake enough for me because I, I had 50 years of the other. Mm. So I'm very happy with that. And just one thing I wanted to say on what you said about um, how egocentric and arrogant we are in the West. Yes, but actually what I meant in terms of arrogance was a step deeper. And it's the arrogance of believing that your opinions, interpretations, and judgments are true and real the menu meal thing that's the real arrogance is that our symbolic representations of reality which is what a thought is an idea a concept a judgment it's a symbolic representation yeah you think you have a concept about reality you have an idea about reality you have a belief about reality that's a symbol yeah it's yeah. not reality, but we think it's reality. That's mm -hmm. the arrogance. We don't understand that we don't know anything. <laughs> we only know our own thoughts. We are wholly ignorant. You know, Socrates said it. If I'm wise, it's because I know I know nothing. That's the truth. And that's the arrogance that I don't think um, indigenous people share as badly because they know that nature is, so, you know, if you have to live in a jungle, it just keeps you humble. You know, you could die any minute if you eat the wrong thing or, you know what I mean? Like you could starve if you can't hunt. So you have to stay humble and present to live in like real nature, whereas we, our lives are so comfortable, you know, and if you're good at a particular skill, you can make a lot of money, you can have all the food you need, you can have all the pleasures of life because you're, you have some kind of intelligence that makes you be able to do something valuable in the world. So you think oh, yeah, all my thoughts are true. I know what I'm doing. I understand life. Look how much money I've got. Look at the girls I can get. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's how people think. It's like, if I'm successful in life, I must, my judgments must be right. But no, mm -hmm. that's got nothing to do with it. Your judgments cannot be right because they're always symbols. Yeah. A, a symbol can never be the thing. Yeah. It doesn't matter how accurate it is. It can never be the thing. Like I said, a menu can describe a meal incredibly accurately but you can't eat a menu and mm -hmm. so your thoughts can never be true <laughs> this yep. is what people don't understand and so and that is the thing that requires i think requires suffering if we if we humbled ourselves without suffering i don't think we'd need it but i think it's so hard for people to humble themselves and disidentify from thinking that their thoughts are true and real that we need suffering for that mm. yeah well said oh man <laughs> I don't even know where to go. That's great. I'm, mm. I'm, I'm, I must be a decent interviewee then. Yeah, I mean, I could listen to you talk for this whole time. I'm gonna just sit back and listen to you. I don't know. Well, you uh, ask good questions though, bro. I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's definitely a two way street. You have to ask the right good questions. That's true. That's true. Yeah, man. 
I hope to reach a point in the future, maybe this is just my idealism speaking, where we don't have to have suffering to be already on the wavelength of God. You know, we're just born into God. There is no separation. We need to go through shit in order to wake up and humble ourselves. And then we realize the magnificence of the moment. It's like, no, we just by default magnificence of, of the moment. And I know one could say, well, yeah, you're, you're already in the magnificence of the moment. There is no separation between you and that. I, yeah, I understand that, but it's like the, the realization of that. Yeah. I, you know, I wish we could come to a point where there was no need for suffering. Like why, I don't know. This is just me thinking out loud. It's just like, why do we even have to go through it? And that's pretty much the question that Yogananda asked from Mana Maharshi. He was like, well, why do we even have to go through the shit in the first place to get to the, to get to the light? You know, why do we yeah. have to go through the darkness to get to the light? It doesn't. It it's doesn't the compete. ultimate question. It's yeah. the ultimate question. Why is it like this? Why does yeah. it have to be like this? Basically. Yeah. It's like, how do we come so far from God? <laughs> it seems, you know, it's like, why? I don't know. I guess that's just part of the game. It's the divine dilemma. I actually have a poem about it, but God is on his own or God, God is on its own. Mm -hmm. God's not a man, obviously. Uh, <laughs> God is on its own and it's bored. And so it made up the play, the dance, the Leela, the Maya to play with itself. It yeah. divided itself up into lots of different rays of light or lots of different waves so that it could play jam. I call it the, the cosmic jam. It's like God jamming with itself. And, and the reason that suffering, is, it's not necessary. So let me go back to that. Your dream of, of no suffering is the dream of every human being with a heart. <laughs> we see suffering in the world and we don't want it. Of course not. Why? We don't want anyone to suffer, least of all ourselves. But none, none of us, anyone with a heart wants what you want. I want what you want. Um, I would say the difference is, is that I recognize uh, the, uh, the purpose of suffering or the purpose of darkness or the purpose of evil or whatever you want to call it is that basically – in order for God to know itself in its own experience. So in, in order, for, basically, okay, so if you're playing golf, a hole in one is an amazing thing to happen if you, if you play golf, yeah? It's, it's something to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Imagine if every single time you teed off, you got a hole in one. <laughs> yeah. It would be meaningless, wouldn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah? Yeah. And, and that is God's situation. Because God is perfect and whole and complete, there's no challenge. There's no fun. There's yeah. nowhere to go, as it were. And obviously, I'm, I, it's a metaphor, but I'm just trying to give a, a story to describe why we need darkness, why we need duality, why we need suffering. Yeah. And if you imagine that you are the all, all that is, there is nothing that is not you. There's no loss. There's no failure. There's no need. There's no... There's nothing bad, mm -hmm. <laughs> sat chitananda. It, you're literally just in bliss. However, before you can actually experience the bliss, you have to have a context or a contrast. There must be, if everything is light, nothing is light. Yeah. Light only has meaning in, in yeah. relation to darkness. Up only has meaning in relation to down. And that is God's dilemma. God is everything. Mm. So there is nothing that is not God. But because there is nothing that is not God, God can't know it's everything. It's nothing. <laughs> that's, wow. the all, that's the nothing thing. So God is in this state where in order to know itself, it has to pretend that there's something other than God. And that thing that it pretends is darkness fear, suffering, duality. Mm. That's the pretend thing. So it, it's necessary for God to know itself. However, we as God selves, it's not necessary. Once God did it in the eternal moment, you know, it's already done. Like, you know, darkness was created and instantly God knew itself and God has known itself eternally, as it were. So it's not a linear thing. It doesn't, we don't need to experience enough darkness to know ourselves as God, but we, we are just, we're just asleep until we wake up to the fact that God has already solved all problems and everything's bliss. We go through a journey and, and that, that is God going through that journey itself. And basically if you were God and you knew that basically you were eternally happy, you wouldn't mind a bit of suffering. That's the honest uh, truth. Yeah. You wouldn't mind a bit of suffering. 
And in fact, like every movie needs a good villain. Every good story needs conflict. It's that is true. That is true of God. And God wants to have every adventure you can ever imagine, every epic adventure, every life, every experience you could possibly imagine. God is it. And so God wants to experience it. And that includes a child dying, uh, you know, young, the, you know, something that's terrible for us. But God actually wants that experience because God wants to know itself in fullness and God is infinite possibility. So anything that could be, God wants to experience because that's how it knows itself in fullness. So God is infinite possibility, infinite potentiality. So anything that could potentially possibly be is something that God wants to know in its own experience. And it uses the universe to do that. So it has the sun experience, the moon experience, the tree experience, the ocean experience, the Gary experience, the Chris experience, the ant experience, the dying young experience, <laughs> uh, the uh, getting cancer experience. Every single one of those is one of the infinite possibilities of reality and that is what god is god is the infinite possibilities so every experience is something that god chooses to have yeah. because god doesn't limit itself to only that experience and that's yeah. the thing about the witness you can remain the witness while you're being crucified that's what christ was doing christ chose to be crucified christ was literally saying look they can do whatever they want to my body i am not the body I am you, I am this, I am that, I'm all of it. It doesn't matter what happens to my body. And I can love you, my brothers and sisters, even while you betray me and crucify me. That's what the crucifixion was. And that's what a master does. A master demonstrates, reflects back who you really are. You are me, you are all of it. And, you know, as I said, God doesn't mind a bit of suffering. We do. So it, it, it's, you know, incumbent on us to, to stop suffering. That's what my channel's about. You know, you don't have to suffer at all. But if you continue identifying with the small self or your thoughts or your emotions or your ego, it's suffering is built in. So like I said before, live your human life full out, you know, enjoy yourself, enjoy your life as much as you can. When it comes to the point that you just can't take it anymore and you don't want to suffer, don't commit suicide. Wake up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, man. Wow. Clip that one. <laughs> Seriously, that was really good. Thanks, man. And now would you say, building on that note, once one does have the dawning of the Christ mind, that in this divine play of Leela, of God, experiencing everything that can be experienced, as us in our humanly form, we know that there is going to be said suffering. In that suffering, our duty, per se, is to love through that suffering to forgive them father for they do not know would you say that is how the instrument of our sense of individuality um expresses itself with this dawning that it actually is god in a sense that's beautiful man you you took the words right out of my mouth yeah <laughs> love your way through it that's exactly what we say walk mm. through your fears and be with your pain fundamentally mastery which is um, the choice to remember yourself, the choice to remember that you're God. Uh, and that everybody the, the, else is. Uh, oh, yeah, to remember that, there's, that there is only God, we say. Yeah. Just to, we call it, so it's the atonement, the at one -ment, is the awakening of all of creation oh, I never to the realized truth of God's presence. Like that. At yeah. <laughs> wow. At one -ment. That's what it means. Etymology. That's good. Yeah, man. It's a good one, isn't it? And yeah. uh, and 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 the, the atonement, Jeshua describes it as the awakening of all of creation to the truth of God's presence. And so that is what, um, in our tradition, that's a master accepts the atonement for him or herself. In other words, he awakens to the truth of God's presence within and around, and then he becomes the servant. And the servant 
is does what you say, loves through it, forgives all, and, and literally just radiates out the peace of God that passes all understanding in all their interactions. That's that's the point of individual enlightenment. Body is the body sattva. You know, mm-hmm. the body sattva vow is I will not go fully into enlightenment until all my brothers and sisters come. And, and that in, in the Christ tradition, that's absolutely what it is. It's that um we forgive everything and everything because we know it's all God. <laughs> no one's ever done anything to me. I, I know that. Like, uh, you know, uh, well, my part, no one's ever, ever done anything to me. It's just me doing it to myself, me as God doing it to myself, having a dance of relationship. So there's actually no need for forgiveness. But, you know, while we're in duality, there seems to be. But all forgiveness is, is just the remembrance of the truth. We're all one. There's only one of us here. Who is there to forgive, basically? And But to take that attitude when you're being crucified, for example, or betrayed, that's mastery. You know, like yeah. to forgive the people who betray you, the people that you all you've done is heal them <laughs> and, and love them, and they turn you into the Romans to be crucified. You know, yeah. can you imagine how most of us would take that? No. Yeah. <laughs> that's why That's why the story of Jesus, he is, he is the one, because it's like, how, could you do that? Could anybody else do that? And right, exactly. Ideally, yes, but it's like that's exactly. why exactly he's, he's the one. He's the exemplar. He is yeah. the exemplar. Yeah. Him and the Buddha are the two great teachers of the world, in in in, in my understanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, but Jesus is tops, specifically because he went through a hero's journey arc. Uh, Jordan Peterson said that has a wonderful video about this. He goes, he he's the greatest man ever because all he did was love and heal and help people. And then the worst thing you could ever imagine happening to anybody happened to him, who was, you know, the nicest guy ever. Mm. So he is the perfect example of um, your story can't be worse than Christ. Oh, yeah. Whatever happened to you can't be worse than Christ. And look what he did. Oh, That's yeah. why he did it. If I can do it, given what's what's happened to me, so can you. Damn. He is the exemplar. That's exactly why he did exactly that. That's pretty powerful. Wow. Oh, man. And I mean, even if he was an actual historical figure or not, it doesn't really matter. It's the story. It's the lesson that comes with that. The the teaching that comes from it. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. That's what's pretty powerful about that is like Jesus's teachings might not have even been Jesus's teachings, if that makes sense. It might have just been like he was the teaching. Like his entire yeah. life was the example. And if it, if he actually existed in a bodily form or not, doesn't matter. And that's how powerful that story is. That's why it's so poignant for all of us, because it's like, yeah. oh, it's just some hits in our heart. The archetype of the, the hero like that is, that is the archetype. <laughs> it is the archetype. Absolutely right. And you said it, you literally, when you said his life is the teaching, that also answers your question about what is the, how do, when we work through suffering what's our job your life is a teaching that's what Jeshua wants is for everyone to follow in his footsteps not mm-hmm. in terms of being crucified obviously that was a very specific choice that he yeah. made or his soul made but for you to live as authentically as that yeah what so that you your do? life is a teaching yeah. And everyone can do that. That's one thing everyone can do. Everyone can live their life full out uh, as they are guided or called or moved to do. Yeah. We don't. And why don't we? Because we listen to the voice in the head that never shuts up that you think is you. <laughs> uh, very little guidance comes through the voice in the head. Sometimes, you know, you can have what I call divine thoughts, particularly if you're creative. You know, when you're inspired, to write something or paint something or make something to me, that's, that's direct from God. Um, but most, uh, promptings of the soul come as, you know, visions, feelings, you know, just a sense. They don't come as words, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? So most of the time intuitive it's guidance. listening to the words in your head yeah. that blocks you from your own guidance. Yep. And if you just listen to your own guidance, you would be a master. You would live a life that you wouldn't even imagine you could live because your soul or your God self is capable of all sorts of things that your ego isn't. 
you know, like you're, you know, there's genius in everybody. Yeah. <laughs> everyone has God at the core and everyone has genius at the core. But we, most people, obviously some people tap into their genius totally. Tesla, you know, there's loads of geniuses yeah. that have done things that just blow your mind. But it's because they're just channeling direct guidance, direct wisdom, direct intelligence from source. Yeah, And anyone can do that. Like literally anyone can do that. They might not become Tesla because that's not their part. You know, that's not their soul's choice. Mm -hmm. They might have a different experience, but be a genius in their own way. Yeah, And it's, so it's in all these individual genes, the world you talked about where we we're, were born in and there's no suffering. That is, you know, that's the golden age or the, um, you know, the yuga after the Kali yuga. Mm -hmm. That's the, you know, that's the place where, where the, after the atonement, when we all realize, oh, we're all one being. It's like, imagine if all the cells in your body suddenly realize they're all part of one body. Hmm. You know what I mean? It's like that. that, that it would be like the, the whole, and not just humans, the animals, everything on the planet, rocks included, all had an awareness that there is only God. And that is the atonement. And once that happens, then we, you know, that's the next level, as it were, <laughs> level up. That's when we're when life isn't about what it's about for us, which is waking up. It's about the creative adventure yeah. of being mini god, or, or, or lots yeah. of mini gods. What yeah. can we create as mini gods working together? Yeah, wow, yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it starts right now, right and now. It starts right now. One can embody that. Right we're here, doing yeah. it we're doing it right now with this you know what i mean this the, mm. the, these kind of interactions between genuine um uh, people who are genuinely uh focused on awakening let's say uh, there's uh, different ways of saying it i would say people who are generally heart centered yeah these um that's what we're doing mm. yeah and the thing is too right once one becomes an instrument of the divine it's not like we lose our sense of individuality. It just gets put to use a little bit different. We all become our own Tesla. <laughs> and that's beautiful. It's that's beautiful. how it's supposed to be, man. Yep. And ultimately that leads to, yes, getting back to it, less suffering. Once one embodies their Dharma, becomes the willing... Uh, servant of God. Yes. That's pretty much, I, as I see it, the perfect embodiment of a human being. <laughs> you know, 100%. it's pretty, it's putting it very simply, obviously, but it seems like that's once one goes within themselves, speaking personally, it seems like that's the wavelength is we get linked up to this sort of other force that we didn't know existed, that isn't actually another force. It's actually just something that we are a part of and we just kind of lost our way. Once we get linked up to that, come back into God, God comes back into the human <laughs> and works its way uh, almost as an art form, using our bodies, using our, our 10 fingers and our minds, becoming the paintbrush of God in a way. Uh, it's quite beautiful. Yeah, it's, there's less inertia in life. There's more of a flow state. And there's just more magic, I feel as though, in this humanly life. And there are still events that um, are quite dark, one could say. There's some ups and downs. There's still the twists and turns in the humanly form. It's just a little bit different. Because like we said before, we realize that we're not those things. There is... Our identity, if you want to even call it an identity, is way greater than the temporary phenomena of our thoughts, of all the sensations of the mind. We're way greater. And there's, there's, a, there's some kind of other order, if you want to call it an order, that's, um, that's working its way in to our lives. That's kind of behind the scenes. It's not really behind the scenes, but from how we perceive it, it seems to be a little bit behind the scenes. And in that surrender to that order, I feel as though one can bear any kind of metaphorical crucifixion that comes into their life. And I feel as though that's what this, that's what the path is all about. Yeah. Couldn't have put it better myself, bro. Couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs>
Yeah, man. Absolutely beautiful. I mean, you said something which uh, it teaches in the way of mastery is that once you um, accept the atonement and awaken to the truth of God's presence, the ego is, you said the exact phrase, it's used differently. Mm. So the, 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 before you awaken, the ego uses you. <laughs> it uses your, your, your divine being for its yeah. agenda, which is pleasure and pain, right? Yeah. So it's like the, the, the ego uses you. When you awaken, you use the ego. Or the ego is, becomes the servant of God. It yep. becomes the, the container, the instrument. Like you said, uh, you called it pain. I always see myself as a God's saxophone. That's my little joke I have. <laughs> Is that I'm God's saxophone and mm-hmm. the, the bliss of God playing music through you. I mean, yeah. I can't even, I don't, hopefully I shouldn't need to describe it, but my job as a, as God's saxophone is to stay tuned. Mm. Yeah. Stay tuned. That's right. my job. That's our job is to stay tune yourself, tune yourself so that when God plays the music through you, that music, um, you know, ripples out and, entrances people in God's love. That, that's that's all your, your own job is to be as pure of a channel, as pure of an instrument as you can be. And and God doesn't care. God, God's not sitting there, well, you're not pure enough for me. I'm not going to play any music through you. It's not like that. It's not a judgmental thing. God's doing it anyway. It's just unconditional. It's just happening, abundant, giving, you know. If you, again, this is another thing I always go into. People don't realize <laughs> that, all your need. Everyone talks. My needs. My needs. My needs. My needs haven't been met. Or my emotional needs. This needs. All your needs have been met. The evidence for this is that you're still here. Hmm. Everything you've needed to be, you've got. The, the truth is, God has been giving you everything all the time, your whole life, and all your lifetimes. So the abun- We don't really understand abundance. We don't really understand it, but. That is a small little thing on it is that everything you need to exist as a human being, you have because you, you, you're you still here. That's the evidence. You're still here. And it's always true. Until the moment your, your body passes, all your needs would have been met. We, we are without need. That's what I'm trying to say is that God is that which is without need. And we are mini God. We're without need because Big God is giving us everything we need all the time. Yeah. And uh, we, we're just so unappreciative yeah. of God's love. That, that's the way I, my, you know, my most recent awakening, <laughs> recent, listen to him, uh, but but the one that feels more lasting and permanent than the previous ones. Um, the difference was, is that now my understanding is that that state of being completely at peace, completely relaxed, contented and satisfied, that I would say is a half decent description of what people call awakening. I realized it wasn't so much all those things, it wasn't those adjectives, it was simply that I was aware of God's presence as my own being, like the core of me, oh yeah, I, 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 you know, it was like God was looking out of my eyes. Oh. And that is my, that to me, that, that, so what I guess what I'm trying to say is because of the history of the Christian church and religion in general, I'm really glad that you don't mind speaking about God because a lot of non-dual spiritual types don't like God yeah. because it's got all those associations. Yeah. Uh, and they prefer, you know, the self or consciousness. And, uh, you know, the, the Eastern words are less, you know, they're less, less entangled. Less weighted, yeah. Less weighted, exactly. So, however, what I've learned, because I've been teaching for a while, you know, and I did what Eckhart Tolle did. So in his book, in The Power of Now, he, he calls it being. You know, he uses words that don't have too much weighting because he wants the simple teaching to get across. And I thought it was brilliant. It was really good. It's why it was a bestseller. Um, and I've adopted that frame in my teachings. I don't use, I have in the past, I haven't used the word God. I haven't used any kind of religious words. Um, but then there was a change in me and I, I just thought, well, it's inauthentic for me to teach liberation or to teach meditation in a way that I don't 
do it or or, yeah. or experience it. And I love God. I love. I'm always thinking about God. I I I love God. I really do. And I just thought I'm not going to not say it anymore. Yeah. And so I just started saying, God, 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 God's love, God, like that. And, and, and the more I did it, the more I touched people, mm. the, the more people really resonated. And, and my students, when I describe, I, I, say to, I say to them, we can describe awakening all these different ways. Uh, but what it boils down to is as soon as you know, oh, it's God. As soon as you know, this is God's love I'm feeling. End of, you don't need anything else. Yeah, you really yeah. don't like it's you really don't. It's, it's as simple as that. So I've kind of simplified all my stuff and it's like the presence of God's love. That's it. That's all you need. And once you know that, that this is God's love and it is inseparable from me, you're home. You know, you, you've got the journey, but you, 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 you will never go back to suffering. Mm -hmm. Once you know that God is who you are and who you are is what God is. Once you know there's no way of separating you and you actually feel in your body the tingling aliveness of God's presence, it's game over. <laughs> yep. There's <laughs> no going back. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. And then and that puts into context, you know, the non-dualists saying, oh, there is no self. There is no self. You know what I mean? It's like compared to God's love, that ridiculous intellectual non-duality it's it's ridiculous it's so silly yeah it's like yeah but yeah but what about god's presence oh there is no self <laughs> there is no god you know it's yeah. like who cares what you think about it <laughs> can you feel it mm. have you seen tenet yeah mm -hmm. so I, I love tenet i know a lot of people didn't like it but i love it i love that line as well what's the line don't try to understand it feel it mm. that's that's it it's yeah. like don't try to understand it don't filter it through your beliefs yeah just feel it man just feel it man i feel it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the thing is you can't over conceptualize god i mean you can't conceptualize god at all there is no formulation or proof to god other than some kind of direct subjective experience in the moment that's it that's there, it there's nothing like i can't think about it and I know it's funny because we're talking about it right now, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's not that easy. Like there's nothing that anybody could say or anything that I could read that would really give me the dawning and the revelation that I've had previously that I'm having now of, of the presence of God in the moment. There's, it's not intellectual. It's really not. Um, it's quite peculiar in that way. Because like I said, we're talking about it. There's plenty of books on it. But really, <laughs> when it comes down to it, it's just like, it's a very personal thing to be able to, to you know, to make the chain, to, to get that transmission of love. Um, but let me ask you this, man. Um, how much time do you have, by the way? I've got as long as you want, mate. I'm loving this. This is a great Okay, show. cool, cool. Um, did you... Oh, okay, so you have, do you have experience with psychedelics? I know you said ayahuasca, right? Uh, ayahuasca, mushrooms, um, LSD, DMT. Yep. You got some pretty. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Do, okay, so do, have you had experiences and revelations from those, like just experiences yes. of love of yes. God from psychedelics? Yes. Yeah, and I, ayahuasca. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I've got loads of stories, and there's two that come to mind. I'm glad that you said uh, of love because one of them is an experience that really showed the nature of my ego to me, which mm -hmm. psychedelics can do very well. Mm -hmm. But the other one showed me the true nature of of the true nature of everything. The true nature of reality is love. So it's so ayahuasca, 2009, and uh, my friend had got this shaman from. I think Peru to come over and we set up a teepee in our back garden and uh, we had a ceremony there with friends. I lived in Brighton at the time and a uh, big circle of people. Uh, have you, I'm assuming you've taken ayahuasca. Uh, nope. Oh, you I haven't? Okay. Talk uh, to many people who have though. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, fine. Yeah. Um, 
So, you, so you're aware that basically it's kind of, it's the opposite of most drugs. It's like when you take it, you feel terrible, but you feel oh, yeah. great the next day mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. And people throw up and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, there's, and, and it's kind of like a teacher that, that it's seen as a, that shows you what you need to see. You set an intention before you drink, you know, you say what you want and then, and then the ayahuasca will, will show you. And that is generally true. Um, I'd taken it two or three times before. This wasn't my first time. This was my third or fourth time. Um, and let me just get this right. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, for me, it was one of those bad ones where very soon after I drank it, I started to feel very, very sick. And I just felt sick pretty much the whole time. Whereas on other ones, I'm not even sick at all. Mm. But this is one of those ones that's really sick. So I obviously had a lot of healing to do. <laughs> Uh, I roll and um, and I remember feeling sick and then I and then and then I don't I can't remember the shift but basically uh, I immediately was reduced to a scared little boy. Wow. I, I recognize myself both in the moment and for the whole of my life. I was like, oh my god, I'm just a scared little boy. I started seeing my life and realizing that. Um, you know, by this, I had two kids, I'd been married, I'd been managing director of a, a media buying business, you know, I'd done lots of things. But I realized that throughout all the things I'd done in my life, I was a scared little boy. Yeah. In truth, everyone, except a, a master or awakened being, is a scared little boy or girl. Mm. That little child never goes away. And actually, it runs our lives through our fears and coping mechanisms and avoidance and guilt and shame and unworthiness and all of this. All the psychological stuff is basically the wound, what we call the wounded child uh, doing its best to get love from the world in the form of validation, attention and approval and doing its best to virtue signal. Aren't I a good boy? Yeah, I'm good. I'm a good person. That's what everyone's trying to do. Mm. And uh, to get security. So material security, money, accomplishment, fame, all that status. That's that's all what's going on with every human being. And it's because there's a scared little child in there that's never grown up. And I realized that about myself. How old was I? Uh, I was 40, 42 or something like that. And I realized, as I said, married and divorced, kids, grown kids, all this stuff. But I was a kid. I was a scared little. It was so obvious you know what uh, these kind of psychedelics can do to you? They can make something as extreme as that seem so clear. It was yeah. so clear. I'm just a scared little boy and always have been. I-, I literally saw that my seven-year-old self was running me. And I was terrified. I-, I was I went into the fetal position and I was just shaking. I was I was literally in that can't cope. Like I can't cope with life. It's too big, it's too much, it's too complicated, which is the reality for all of us we're all that is that's the truth mm. none of us can cope with life that's because we're all scared little boys and girls we're blind we don't know who we are or identify with objects blah 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 blah. so we're all in that situation so i was shivering and crying and literally I, I was literally i was just a, a, a lump of of fear mm-hmm. just a lump of quivering fear and all of a sudden uh, within my vision you know, internally, a figure appeared and I didn't see the face. It wasn't a recognizable Jesus, but it, it was Jesus. And and the reason I knew it was Jesus was, as I said to you before about the books, the love, mm. the love that was emanating from this being, it literally, it was the only thing that a scared little boy could feel or, or, or you know, um, that could reach me yeah. through my fear. It was the love of Christ. It was the love of God. It was unbelievable. I literally was like, oh. And the being took my hand. And like a little boy, he just walked me to this door. And there was a, a door with a universe around it. And I'm trying to think if he opened the door first. Oh, yeah. He opened the door first. And then he said these words, which I've made poems out of and have stayed with me for whatever it is, 14, 15 years. And... It summarizes um, the understanding of love. He said, 
in the space of unconditional love, all your fears are meaningless. Mm. And it was something about meaningless that did it. It was like, and remember, I was quiver, a quivering mess when he appeared. And so he, he was showing me, he opened this door and basically the door was just life, the universe, God. It was basically, it was love. It was just him behind the door. And so I was obviously being uh, a tsunami of love was enfolding me. And then I heard those words in the space of unconditional love, all your fears are meaningless. Yeah. And the trip, uh, or the journey went from quivering mess to absolute ecstatic heaven realms for the next 10 hours. You know what I mean? It was like, bang. And, and in, in the way of mastery, we, we define fear as the contraction away from love, the absence of love. Fear is the absence of love in the same way that dark is the absence of light. And, if something is defined as an absence to a presence, even though, as we were saying before, duality requ up requires down, you know, uh, darkness requires light, even though they require each other, it's the presence that is the primary one. The absence is the secondary one mm. because the absence cannot even be thought about until the other one exists. Mm. Yeah. So, it's like, um, and, and that's the, th the, the thing between love and fear. Love is um, complete. And oh, yeah, so we've got a definition for love, and it will help if I give the definition. So bearing in mind what I just said about in the space of unconditional love, all your fears are meaningless. And love is that which accepts all things, allows all things, trusts all things embraces all things and therefore transcends all things that is the christ mind definition of love love is the, the field of infinite possibility god is love god is love god it's the it's the thing that allows everything to be including fear including darkness including evil so we say even fear rests on love Love allows all possibility. So fear is just the contraction against that. It's just the no, not allow possibility. Mm. And when fear is doused in love, it just dissolves because it's like darkness. You don't, you can't fight darkness and you don't need to just turn on the light. And it's the same with mm -hmm. fear. You can't fight fear and you don't need to just love. Yeah. <laughs> if you love fear will can't be there because fear is the absence of love. Yeah. Just turn on the light. Just turn on the light. Just shine. Yeah. That's so good. I've never heard it put in the way that, um, I'm probably going to butcher it now, but the way of absence and presence, and you need presence first in order for there to be a new, the idea of absence or I'm lack. So, yes. That's yeah. good. <laughs> I'm full of them, mate. I'm full of them. It's so simple, but that makes so much sense. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. That brings me to the uh, the ultimate one of life and death. It's like you can't have death without life. It can't be nothing without something. So it's mm -hmm. just like that's kind of touching upon the essence of our immortality. Yep. It's that we are engulfed in this love at all times. And in, But the thing is, in order to have the love, oh, is it like that though? I was like, oh, sorry, I'm thinking out loud here, man. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good stuff. <laughs> In order to have the love, do we need to have the idea of the lack of love? It's like, no, that's just, that's meaningless. The, the, the lack of love or the lack of life, I guess you could say, is meaningless because there always is love. There always is life. So in that way, death and the absence of love, the absence of life, the absence of here and now doesn't exist. It's a... Uh, it can only be absent for, absent from our awareness. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's never really absent, but it can be absent for you if you yeah. lose awareness of it. Exactly. But in the truth, it's like there is no such thing as absence. It's just like yeah. absence is like created by our egos. Yes, yes. reality is a it's a plenum. Reality is 
the, the word perfect actually means whole. So God or reality is whole and complete. There, there can be no separation. There can be no gaps. There can be no absent. Yeah. There can be nothing just by the nature of, of, of wholeness. And so, yeah, we imagined as God, we imagined separation. We imagined duality. We imagined darkness. We imagined fear. We imagined evil. Mm. All the absences. We, we, we had to imagine them to pretend there was something that was not fullness, light, infinite potentiality. Yeah. Because otherwise we couldn't know what it meant to be the light. It's like it's all, it's all very well to be the light, but if you don't know what it feels like to be the light, who cares? Yeah, right. God just wants to know what it feels like to be God. And so God created that which is unlike God. Fear, darkness, evil, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But even that which is unlike God is God. Mm. You, you can't get away from God. That's the paradox. It's that even that which is supposedly unlike God can only exist because God exists. So it's it's an extension of God anyway. Mm. The, the, the devil is God's helper, basically. The, mm. the, the, not in the Lucifer fall from heaven. Literally, God created the devil yeah. to give him a contrast, to give him a context. context. God doesn't hate the devil at all. God yeah. loves the devil. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. It's like, uh, would there be a Batman movie without the Joker? <laughs> right, exactly. You need the Joker. Yeah. Every story needs a good villain. Thanos, you know, yeah. all, all the best things have the best villains. Damn, man. It's a hero's journey. This is good. This is a good one. And that's what life is all about, right? It's, it's embodying this art form. It's living for the purpose of living. It's the... Uh, I guess when one gets on this wavelength, it seems like life does become some sort of game or movie or play or something that just becomes more enjoyable, right? Like what's the purpose of a game, right? The basic purpose of why we play games, it's to enjoy it. It's yeah. to have a good time. Yeah. Um, when you realize that your life is a sort of game in a way, it's God's game, then I feel as though it does become more enjoyable, plain and simple. It, it does, 100%. 100%. Oh. With my clients and students, especially men, so the two, the two metaphors that work the best, I think, uh, life becomes a dance or a song or a game. Yeah. And I found that, uh, and this is just a generalization, but women tend to prefer the dancing yeah. <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> as you'd expect yeah guys like but, the game they guys like the game because yeah. that's that like, guys like challenges guys like uh guys like games let's face it yeah and and when you make mastery which is what the way of mastery does when you make self-realization a game then you play it right because when you make when when you when you try to awaken as a reactive thing like oh i hate my life you, you fail before you even start because you, you've got to practice with joy. This is one of the things that I teach. If you do a spiritual practice and you do it with seriousness, it won't work because seriousness is of the ego. It's the, the illusion. It's yeah. like that takes it seri itself seriously. God does not take dream, dream, you know, big Chris doesn't take dream Chris seriously. Yeah. It, he knows it doesn't really exist. Right. Yeah. Little Chris takes little Chris very seriously because he thinks he's real. So you, you can always tell to me, a true master is a master that's kind of always giggling and laughing. Yeah. That's why I love Eckhart Tolle of all the masters in the world. He's my favorite because he embodies, he doesn't take himself seriously. Mm -hmm. Like he's the biggest, probably the biggest master in the world. And he just sits there like a little munchkin giggling and taking the Mickey out of the ego, which is if I was a master, well, if I was as big as him, that's what I'd want to do. I'd just be cracking jokes the whole time mm -hmm. because basically we're hilarious. Human beings and the ego is the greatest comedy of all time. Yep. It is the cosmic joke. Yep. And the best way to show people their egos is to take the piss <laughs> out of the ego uh -huh. and, and, and them and yourself. And he does that better than any master I know. And that's why I love him. Uh, but yeah, the, the cosmic joke is that it's like we're we're these kind of dream characters who take ourselves so seriously. Our beliefs, we go to war 
for a fucking made up concept. Think yeah. about it. Like yeah. a belief is just a made up guess <laughs> about life. And we kill people before that's how serious, that's what the ego's like. Yeah. It takes its thoughts and beliefs and interpretations so seriously that it would kill another human being. That is insanity. That's I mean, insane, we are yeah. absurd, ridiculous, and insane. That from the point of view of God, but God understands, you know, it's, it doesn't judge us as that. He laughs. She yeah. laughs. And a master laughs, a smiles, a Buddha smiles because he gets it. He gets it. Well, that's me acting like an egoic idiot. Yeah. yeah Do you know right. what I mean? That's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not some other person who's below me. That's the judgmental. That's the ego way. Oh, they're an idiot and I'm great. That's how people go around. I'm better than you, you know, whereas a master goes, no, that is me. I've done exactly that in a thousand lifetimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not no better than that, mm -hmm. but he can still see that it's ridiculous and absurd and insane yeah. without judging the other brother and sister. Mm. That's the Christ path. Christ, the Christ path is non-judgment. It's equality. We are all perfect children of God. Nobody is above anyone and no one's below anyone. We're all waves on the ocean. We're all, rays of light mm -hmm. and no ray of light is better than another ray of light some rays of light are choosing to have a different experience which might mean that they're a serial killer mm -hmm. some rays of light are choosing to have a different experience which means that they're they work in a charity center you know helping homeless people but from the point of view of the sun it doesn't matter what the rays of light are doing they're all rays of light they're all god it's only from our point of view from our judgmental limited egoic perspective and our limited interpretations and based on our biases and our upbringing and our wounds and our guilt and all this stuff goes into making us perceive certain other people as being above us, better than us or lower than us. But it's all made up. It's all part of that same made up stuff that's going on in our heads that, that we think is true and real. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with anything except what's in your mind, what's in your skull, in fact. Mm -hmm. Well said, man. Hmm. Oh, that's why we walk the path. <laughs> Good stuff. That's it. Well, that's probably what's that? Two and a half hours? I no, don't even an hour know. and a half. Yeah. I think we can probably start to wrap it up at that note. Yeah. 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 I think that feels uh, like uh, a good point, doesn't it? Honestly, yeah, I think um, I, I'm kind of speechless at this point. <laughs> that's what <laughs> happens to me in these top in these uh yeah, in these Excellent. talks. It's just kind of like reach a flat line on uh topics because at the end of the day there's only so much you can talk about this stuff without being redundant exactly repetitive. well i wanted to say gary that i really appreciate your your real time realizations i've really enjoyed watching yeah. you i could just see the look in your eyes you were oh yeah and that is a beautiful thing that's a really beautiful thing because when people watch this they will see how genuine that is <laughs> um and it's it's it, it really made it fun for me to watch that yeah man it's fun for me too that's that's funny <laughs> <laughs> yeah man hey you gotta you gotta wait with words so keep doing your thing i wish you all the best um, thank you man yeah i thank you for your wisdom and time and effort that you brought to this conversation yeah i don't have anything else to say other than thank well, you thanks for inviting me it was an absolute pleasure brother absolute pleasure i knew it would be um and you keep on doing the great great work you're doing and uh yeah you um you um hold to that vision of no suffering anywhere ever it's mm. a good vision you want to mm. hold on to that amen thank you man amen peace and love peace and love okay. everybody peace and love goodbye